if you come from a family of any size at all, then you can probably relate to the idea that everybody in that family kind of has a role, right? If you're the oldest child, maybe you're the responsible one, right? Or if you're the youngest, maybe you're the slacker. Or somewhere in between, you're the one with the temper or the one who's good at math or whatever it is. Everybody in that family kind of has a role, even as you grow up and maybe grow out of that personality type, you still in that family probably still have that role. That's a discussion for another time, really. But but the same thing is true. The, the same thing that is true in families really is true in groups as well. We have different types of group roles, different functions and and personality types and and things that people do in groups, different roles that people play in these groups. And so it's important that we kind of identify what these are and discuss them and how we can best use those to the benefit of the group as opposed to to the detriment of that group. So just real quickly to, to define group roles, what do we mean by that? Roles are simply the expected behaviors or functions of group members, the way that we expect them to behave not necessarily in the explicit rules. These aren't necessarily, you know, you're, you're assigned to do this thing, but these are more, again, personality types or functions that, that in the inner workings of the group that are more unwritten um, behaviors and rules of that group that, that people perform. So this will make much more sense as we get into these things. But um, a few things I want to talk about before we get into the actual roles, the rules of the rules, some things that we need to understand about roles in general. First of all, these roles can be formal or informal. So as I just mentioned, they don't have to be things that are explicitly outlined. Sometimes you do. You identify somebody as the leader and say, you are the person responsible for keeping us accountable in these areas and in these ways and for following these tasks. Uh, but much more often, too, we see informal roles within a group, th things that people just kind of take on. Um, somebody's the group therapist or somebody's the group class clown or whatever. You know, those things are more informal roles. They're not specifically identified by the group, but they still can perform a very important function. Um, so we need to, to identify those as, as equally important as the formal rules. These roles can be played by more than one person. Maybe it's a, more than one person at the same time. Maybe those things um, change over time, but uh, but it can be played by more than one person. These roles can. So you can have more than one person in each of these things. It just depends on the the people in your group and, and the group needs and all those types of things. It's also important to note that one person can fulfill multiple roles. You're not just limited to, well, no, I'm... I'm the task leader, so I can't be the social emotional leader as well. And I can't be the, the, the whatever else I, cause, because this is my role. You can have more than one role, especially in, in smaller groups. You're going to have people that fulfill more than one role. You're going to need to because there's not enough to go around. Um, so one person can fulfill multiple roles. More than one person can fulfill a single role. It just kind of depends on the makeup of the group and the, and the people in that group and again, the needs of that group uh, as they develop. And then a note that roles can change over time. Somebody who does, who fulfills this role at this time may not always fulfill that role. It could be handed off to another person as that person, the first person takes on different roles and needs to give up some of those other things. Or, you know, there's a lot of reasons that these things change, especially groups that are around for longer periods of time. If it's a real short term, you know, group or team, you're not going to see as much of this, but groups that are kind of standing groups and exist for a long period of time, you're going to see roles change over time as people change over time and as the group needs change over time. So uh, we just need to understand that these roles can change over time then as well. Okay, so let's get into the different types of roles um, that we see in these groups. And uh, and just in general, here, there, there are three categories of roles that we see generally, and then we're going to get into the specific roles within each of these. But um, the first are what we call task roles. Task roles have to do with what the group is doing, what they're actually functional, um, what functionally doing. Um, what are they, they're, they're completing a task or achieving its purpose. Those all have to do with task roles. Task roles feed into that, the ability of the group to achieve its purpose and, and, uh, and complete their goals. We also see what we call maintenance rules, which has to do with how group members then get along. Um, can the group maintain social cohesion and fulfill the interpersonal needs of the group members so that the other things can be accomplished? Those are important things there. They're, you know, they may seem like, well, that's not, you know, the group is here to do something. Well, that's true, but there are also people involved. So there are these maintenance rules that we have to, um, to, to fulfill as well in order to get people to do their best and to be able to perform at, at their top um, uh, ability. So we have maintenance rules. So task and maintenance rules can all function toward helping the group accomplish what they're doing in some way or another. But then we also see different kinds of negative roles, which are disruptive behaviors that detract 
from effective group functions. So negative roles, as you might assume, are disruptive. They're things that, that really keep a group from performing to the best of its ability. So these are the three categories of roles that we see. Let's, let's dig a little deeper into each of these and, and identify some specific types of roles within each of these categories. So in the task roles, we see a few different things happening. Um, the first one that we can see is the expediter. The expediter keeps things moving forward without pushing or, or too much or losing sight of the disparate details, the, the different details of things that are happening. So there's a lot happening in a, in a group, right? So we need to be able to, the expediter needs to be able to keep uh, keep tabs on all these things. If you're, if you're familiar with the restaurant business at all, you know that an expediter in a restaurant is critically important. They're the person who's calling out the orders and maybe at different times to make sure the food comes out hot because some things take longer than others to prepare and some things are cold and so forth. So they're, they're distributing the work in such a way that when things are prepared, they're making sure that everything is on the, is, is on that plate in, in that order properly. And, and so they have a lot of responsibility. They're the ones keeping tabs on all of these different things while everybody else is focused on their specific job. In, in a group, the expediter does much the same thing. They're keeping tabs on all these different details that kind of need to happen at the same time, uh, but may have different deadlines and things. So the expediter performs a very important role in the group by keeping track of all that and managing those aspects of things. So again, they keep the group moving forward without really pushing too hard, uh, pushing group members too hard or, or losing sight of the different details that are happening there. Another kind of task role that we see, an important one here, is the information provider. The information provider is, is someone who offers relevant knowledge from their area of expertise. So they don't have to know everything. They don't have to be Google, right, for the whole group. But for their area, they need to be the person who can say, yes, this definitively is what you need to know about this topic or about this, this detail or whatever it is. This is the information provider, somebody who can have that knowledge at their fingertips and really um, provide it when things come up. Now, when would that come up? That would be the information seeker, right? An information seeker and another important role is somebody who requests more information. They request clarification or they request elaboration on items that come up in the group. So there's somebody who's willing to say, I'm not sure about this. Can we, can we come back to this? Can we focus on this for a second and really help me understand this? Odds are as, as, any teacher will tell you if somebody asks a question in class, it's likely that five other people have the same question and just aren't willing to ask it in a group. You really can't have that. You have to have somebody speak up and say, I'm not quite clear on this. Can we, can we explain this a little bit further or can we get a little more detail on this? Can we elaborate on this? That information seeker is an, an important role in the group. You need those folks. So we have the information provider, the information seeker, kind of two sides of the same coin. We also have the gatekeeper. This is the person who helps manage the flow of the conversation during your group meetings. They they pull in quieter members and, and they try to balance discussion time. Try and, you know, again, if you have a quieter member, try and balance that out and pull them in with somebody who's maybe a little more vocal and a little more talkative and say, OK, we haven't heard from this person over here. Can we can we do that? And can we keep the conversation on track or can we can we divert into this important? area they manage that the flow of that conversation the gatekeeper of the the flow of the the meetings and the information um, throughout the group so um, that's an important role then you also have and this is not very uh, not very uh, uh, not not really uh, kind of one of the the roles regarded as as some, something that's more important but truthfully the recorder the person who keeps track of the discussion and the decisions for future reference and they keep notes or they keep minutes. This is an absolutely critical role in a group. You have to have a record of these things. You have to have the ability to go back and say, this is what we decided. And this is what the discussion can't, can't how the discussion came about. And this is where it went. And this is what decision was made as a result. Here's what the vote was and keeping track of who voted, what, if you need to and so forth. So you can go back and do this. You may think you're going to remember things forever. You will not. You need to have a record of these things so you can remember what you decided, when you decided it, and so forth. So that re recorder is a really important task role. Okay, so all of these are things that keep the group moving forward. They keep the group on task. They help the group accomplish each of the things they need to in order to accomplish their, their larger goal. Those are easy kind of to see. But let's take a look at some of the, the more um, you know socialized roles and interpersonal roles. Um, when we look at the maintenance roles of a group, what are we talking about here? And these are critically important as well. So you have, for example, the social emotional leader. This is the person who's, who's keeping touch with the whole group and, and really kind of, uh, and, and not to, to 
be pejorative about this, but they're kind of the, the den mother of the group, right? They're the person who's really keeping in touch with how are people feeling about this? Who's upset? Who's, who's feeling good about things? How can we help everybody feel good about what we're doing and just keeping tabs, trying to keep, you know, the social emotional aspect front and center, because we know that again, will affect task performance as well. It may seem silly, but it does obviously it affects task performance. If somebody's upset and they're, they're feeling unheard or they're feeling whatever it is, they're, they're in their feelings about something something, then they're not going to be performing at their peak. So that social emotional leader needs to be somebody who can keep track of those things, really identify those things and, and work with those folks to help them feel better about things and, and feel like they are, they are contributing and feel like they are part of this group. You also have the supporter, somebody who steps in and says, Hey, you're doing a great job. I know this was a rough day, but you're doing wonderful. And just want to thank you for it. It's an important thing for people to hear. So we have the supporter again, people in, in, in any group are going to have good days and bad days. You need that supporter there to, uh, to help boost people in their down days and help encourage people as well in their good days and help them recognize those things. Then you have the tension releaser, the tension releaser, which is different than a class clown. I want to be clear about that. A tension releaser is somebody who can find those outlets in appropriate moments, in appropriate and sensitive ways for the group members. It's not calling anybody out. It's not feeling, you know, dragging anybody down or anything like that. The tension releaser is finding appropriate ways to again, help find some humor in something and bring joy to the group experience and, uh, and do so in a positive way for everybody, right? Where that rising tide lifts all shifts, no ships, nobody's being brought down as a result of what the tension releaser is doing. So that's really, really important that we have those ability, those moments of levity and laughter and, and, uh, and enjoyment in these groups as well. You have the harmonizer. This is the kind of the, um, the peacemaker in the group, right? The harmonizer, when you have some conflict come up, which is okay in a group, you can have conflict. We just want to make sure that we're having it in the right way. And that harmonizer helps do that. It helps manage those times of conflict in appropriate ways in ways that are positive to the group and constructive for the group. So you need that harmonizer to help kind of smooth over the rougher edges sometime. Then you need the interpreter at times. You sometimes need the interpreter. Now, this is somebody who can help make sense maybe of what someone else is saying or help provide that, you know, understanding between group members if they're just not getting, they're seeing eye to eye or whatever. Um, so, you know, I always think interpreter famously of the scene from Step Brothers, if you're familiar with that movie, where they go into a job interview and they both go into this interview together. And so the one is trying to help interpret for the other. That was not effective and not appropriate in that situation, right? But an appropriate interpreter will be able to um, help you know people find understanding in a group that will help somebody who maybe doesn't understand the concept will help them understand that or maybe somebody who's having trouble expressing themselves expressing their idea the interpreter can help them find a way to express that clearly so that other people do understand it so sometimes we need that third party there right we need that interpreter as a maintenance role as well to help people understand the other people in the group interpersonally if they're just very different. So you need those kind of third party interventions sometimes. Okay. So task roles, maintenance roles, all very positive, all help the group achieve its function, right? But as we talked about, there's a third category where we have these negative roles, which are, are things that detract from group performance and, and, uh, detract the group from achieving what it's doing, right? So, and there are two kinds of negative roles, two, two categories really of negative roles. So let's take a look at each of those and then the, the specific roles within that. The first ne type of negative role is what we call self-centered role, a self-centered role, which has to do with that person. It's all about that person, right? So you see things like the central negative role, uh, which this person um, is constantly giving the thumbs down to everybody's idea, right? They, they, because they're upset with the group or whatever, they, they're, they're ticked off that they're not the leader. For whatever reason, they just keep downing everybody's idea. And it's, it's different than playing devil's advocate. This is not just, you know, trying to make sure that we're on the best idea. This is just somebody who just outright is just, nope, nope, that's about it. Nope, I don't like that. Nope, that sounds terrible. You don't want that. That's it's going to demoralize the group in every way. So that's not a great uh, thing to have. You have the monopolizer, somebody who has to be the center of attention, right? So this can play out to be like the stage hog. I was thinking of the, the, um, the, the um, diversity seminar that they had on the office. If you've seen the office, um, diversity center is, uh, um, seminar that they had, which of course they were having because of Michael, but he can't, 
not be the center of attention, right? So he tries to take over the seminar from the person who's sent to conduct it and tried and ends up monopolizing everything, ruining the entire seminar, right? Uh, which was hilarious in the context of the TV show, but in real life is not so funny. You don't want a monopolizer or somebody who just, whether they know anything or not, has to be the center of attention, takes things over, monopolizes the conversation, monopolizes, you don't get anything done that way. Uh, there's the self-confessor who treats a group like it's their private therapy session, you know, and, and so th they just kind of de derail everything because they treat it like a like a group therapy session. And, and that's not productive. And then you have the compliment seeker, somebody who's constantly fishing for compliments, even though it may have nothing to do with what the group is doing, but they're constantly looking for that affirmation, right, that they want the. And so this it totally derails the function of the group as well. And then finally, the Joker, which we I mentioned before, kind of, but this is different from the tension release, right? The, the Joker does so in a negative way, either because it it pulls somebody else in the group down or it distracts from what the group is doing. It's inappropriate in the timing or in the, the context or whatever it is. So the Joker is not an appropriate form of tension release. You want to you want to know the difference between those things. So you have the Joker sometimes. These are all things that are designed to pull attention to that individual, to that specific person, because they want to be the center of attention. So you have these self-centered roles, which all detract from group performance. The other type of negative role that you have is the unproductive role, where people are just not not functioning. They're just, they're just not being productive, right? And there are a couple of different forms of this. You have the blocker, which is somebody who just, who basically is sabotaging the group, doing the opposite of what they can to help the group be productive. They're just doing whatever they can to kind of undermine what the group is doing. You have that blocker, right? For whatever reason, they don't want to be there. They don't like that they're not the leader. They don't like whatever. They're just going to do whatever they can to kind of sabotage things. You have the social loafer who sees this as an opportunity to, to rely on the rest of the group to do their work for them. Right. They, they feel like they can coast by and float on, you know, on the, on the group's coattails. They can grab onto the, go, the coattails of the group and ride the group's good performance and their good work without really doing much themselves. So you see that a lot in groups at times. You have the aggressor, somebody who's just, you know, getting combative and, and conflict oriented and really um, pushes others, even if it has nothing to do with what the group is doing. They're just constantly trying to get into a battle with somebody else in the group. Or you have the doormat, somebody who, like, like Milton from Office Space, if, and this is going back a little ways, but if you've seen the movie Office Space, Milton is the is the you know perpetual doormat. People just kind of walk all over him, forget he's there. He goes to this party where everybody's getting cake, and they keep having him pass it along, pass it along, pass it along. He ends up with no cake, right? He's the doormat. He's always the person who's getting stepped on and walked over, and and uh, and in the end, you know, as we've seen that movie, it, be, it can become combative in that uh, you know. Doesn't always. It's not always as extreme as Milton's case, where he burns down the building, right? But, um, but we see this a lot when people feel ignored, then they they just aren't productive. They don't they don't feel like they need to do anything in the group, so they just kind of drift off and and become forgotten. And so you don't want that either. These are all unproductive things. If you have a group member there, you want to make use of them. Right? So what we know from you know the office and from your office and any group that you've been in is that uh, one one of the things we see in the office is that it really does take all these different types. Hopefully not the negative ones. We see the impact that that has, but uh, but we see that it does take all types for an office to be successful. I mean, they have different types of personalities in the office and and in any group really. So you need somebody filling as many of these task and maintenance roles as possible to to really have the group fulfill its full potential and to to fill all of these lanes. If you have questions about the types of group roles or anything else to do with small group communication, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope you have a renewed understanding of the different types of group roles and the important, um, important ways that they play into the function of small group performance.